We'll turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Acts, chapter number 21. Acts chapter number 21, we spent uh, quite a bit of time in Acts 20 as Paul set forth a model of ministry uh, to the pastors who were there in Ephesus. He met with them in Miletus. Paul is on his way, you may recall, to Jerusalem, and he is going to now uh, continue on that particular path uh, today, and we're going to spend uh, time getting him to Jerusalem. One of the struggles that we all face with life is the uncertainty that life has for us. We often think of things as being rather certain. Proverbs was very clear to remind us not to boast ourselves of tomorrow. And the reason was given because you know not what a day may bring forth. We may have certain plans and all of those things, but the reality is that all of those things are subject to a, uh, an incredible degree of uncertainty. And many in uh, many parents, for example, will uh, want ultimately what is best for their children. Uh, there's not a parent who uh, doesn't want things to go well for their children. And sometimes when we are faced with uncertainty and sometimes when we're faced with perhaps even difficulty ahead, what we'll find is that our resolve to do right is going to, at that point in time, be questioned. Right now in America, it's quite easy, to be honest with you, to be a Christian. It costs us uh, very little. Uh, we are able to uh, pay, pay a little bit of gas and, and uh, drive to services today. And I'm thankful that you did so, by the way. And, uh, but you, you're able to be here. We're able to worship. We're not fearing uh, some sort of uh, arrest. We're not having to meet underground. We're not having to do all of these things in secret like so many other Christians are across the world. But what would happen if for you and your own personal walk with the Lord, if you knew that danger was ahead? If all of a sudden you knew that your Christianity was now at some point now going to begin to cost, how committed would you remain? You see, oftentimes we are very comfortable on roads that we've been before. We can, uh, we, I've learned this definitely in driving uh, the motor coach, and, and uh, when you're on a road you've been on a million times, you hardly think anything of it. But when you end up on that road you've never been on, uh, maybe it's a rural country road, and uh, there, are un, there are just things that you may not ever start thinking through, going through your mind. Here's one of the thoughts, for example, I wonder what would happen if I come across a, one of those little bridges over a little creek, now I've driven five miles. You don't think of those things in your car. Uh, I wonder what would happen if all of a sudden I find myself in turn I, I can't make. Now what? I recently uh, went up to uh, Cataloochee, North Carolina. I don't know if you've ever been to Cataloochee. I'm not talking about the ski slope. Uh, that's enough of, of an area, but the actual Cataloochee. And there's not much to it. If you blink, you'll miss it. Uh, there's one way in to Cataloochee. Some of you may know the name of the road, Cove Creek Road, and uh, right up off of, of 40, basically. And uh, about the last exit before you can... If you ever want to go to Cataloochee, go and see elk. But if you ever want to go, get off at exit, I believe it's 24, and then you're going to turn right on Cove Creek Road. <clears throat> You'll see what Cove Creek Road does. Uh, they had asked me if I'd ever been on it, and I hadn't. I could tell from the map that it was not going to be a very pleasant road. Thankfully, I was in a, uh, a much smaller uh, mini coach, more otherwise it could not have been done. But as you're going up the road, it's narrow, and you're kind of winding on up the little mountain, and then it gets narrower, and then it goes to gravel, and then it goes to about a lane and a half. And if you meet someone, I just stopped. I'm not moving. <laughs> uh, somebody's going to have to move, but it's not going to be me. And if you hit a, a vehicle that stopped, that's your fault, not mine. And so I just stopped. And up we go, up and down this windy, really, really, really windy. It's a beautiful area. And when you finally get there, there's all sorts of elk that'll just come out. It, it really is a neat thing. And you want to talk about an extremely high degree of uncertainty. There was 
not a part of me that was comfortable in the least bit. One of the ladies, and I tried, of course, not to let it show, but one of the ladies on there says, I sure hope your brakes work. I said, what brakes? <laughs> uh, that, that did not create a, a favorable uh, thought for them, but uh, uh, oh, this is fine, you know, this, yeah, this is great. And, and uh, of course, then, then you come back out of it, and we got to come back out of it at nighttime, and that was even more entertaining. There's all sorts of uncertainty. When it said there's a there are no guardrails. There was one place where I'm guessing someone probably died and they went ahead and put those little concrete, like on a construction zone, they put the little concrete wall. They put that along the, the edge there. But it's, there's only one lane there. There's no way two could get through. So my guess is that something did not happen very favorably at that particular point. Uh, but nonetheless, I was faced with a whole lot of uncertainty. You know, the reality is that in many ways, I think we are faced with an increased level of uncertainty. We're entering into a uh, political season in which uh, people have said the stakes have never been higher. Uh, well, they probably haven't in our lifetime. I don't know that that's fair to say over the entire course of the nation, but there is a great degree of uncertainty that's there. What's going to happen in years to come when, if America continues to turn its back on God, is it going to be troublesome for us as believers? Are we going to be faced with the threat of persecution? Are we going to be faced with some of the challenges that may very well come? I believe the answer to that, by the way, is yes, unless we turn back to the Lord. Acts chapter 21, we find Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. It's a journey that uh, is a very long and arduous journey, and it's one that's going to entail tremendous dangers and perils. And in addition to uh, the uh, peril of just a considerable amount of time sailing, uh, Paul is going to face those who are going to, in essence, try to dissuade him from doing what is right. In life, there are always those people who are going to say, you can't, or you shouldn't, or don't do these things. And it's exactly what Paul faces here in Acts chapter 21. Paul knew that he was to go to Jerusalem. In spite of the difficulties that he would face, Paul remained resolute in his determination to get to Jerusalem. Eventually, the time comes, he's been now in Miletus, he's addressed the Ephesian elders, verse 1 of chapter 21, the Bible says, it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto coast, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patera. Now, eventually the time came when Paul had to leave the elders from Ephesus in Miletus. Obviously, the friendship was one that was very great, as we saw at the end of chapter 20. They were greatly disturbed by the reality that they would not see his face any longer. In fact, the phrase gotten suggests that they literally had to tear themselves away. It was a separation that for them would be one that was very difficult, but it was one that was equally necessary. I don't have a map in front of me uh, today, nor do you, unless you've got or are able to get one in the back of your Bible. But if you're able to, you'll find my leaders, and then they'll begin making their way ultimately down and around the bend out into the Mediterranean Sea. And so they first go uh, south to the island of coast. It's about 45 miles south of Miletus. The Bible says that they sailed with a straight course there. The idea would be that they, the winds were very favorable and it allowed them to be able to uh, make this journey really without any problem. From then, then they're going to go the next day to the island of Rhodes. And again, you're going to start wrapping around the corner. And then from thence, they'll sail uh, over to Patera. Patera is actually going to be on the mainland. Uh, and they'll end up sitting there. Then the Bible says, and finding a ship sailing over into Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Paul is trying to get ultimately to Jerusalem, and he does so, we might say it, with a bunch of layovers. <laughs> uh, this time it's all by boat. And this time now they get to Patera and they find a, a ship that is going to end up sailing all the way over to Phoenicia. This is now going to be heading towards Israel, but way north of Israel, all right? Uh, Paul, if you may recall on the map uh, with Paul's um, 
when he was up in Antioch in Syria, Antioch was up in the corner right as the Mediterranean Sea worked around. Phoenicia is going to be the region just south of there. So this ship is going to now set that direction, presumably some sort of a cargo ship. And the Bible says, verse 3, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. The phrase that suggests that we had discovered Cyprus does not mean that they were as Christopher Columbus and uh, they were on a maiden voyage and were now able to discover new land and they st uh, stuck a flag in the ground. That's not at all what happened. It just simply means that they sailed within sight distance of the island of Cyprus. It was on the port side or it was on the left side and they were just skirting south of the island that's out there in the Mediterranean Sea. They just skirted south of it and they were able to see it and then they sailed into Syria and they landed at the port city of Tyre and it was there that the ship was to unlaid her burden. It was to unload her cargo. Now, you may uh, be familiar with Tyre. If I use it with Tyre and Sidon, you probably are very familiar with it. Uh, Jesus in Matthew, I believe it's 23, pronounced various woes on a variety of cities. Tyre is one of them, Tyre and Sidon. If the works that had been done in thee had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, Okay, They had known the truth of the word of God, yet they chose to reject it. Nonetheless, that's where they are. While they were there, they actually ended up remaining there now for seven days. And finding disciples, the Bible says, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now, the word finding does not mean that they were just kind of walking aimlessly around and happened to discover some disciples or some followers of Jesus Christ. It instead suggests the idea that they purposely set forth to try to find these individuals. They searched out for disciples and they found them. They got there, they found that in this region there were also committed followers of Jesus Christ. Let me just kind of hit a little bit of a time out button and point out, you know you are not the only saved godly person in this world. Okay? We tend to think of you know, ourselves, and, and then there's everyone else. Or maybe we think of America and then all the other nations. There are other Christians who are in other nations who are doing a phenomenal work for the Lord. And there are other pastors and other churches today that are very faithfully proclaiming the Word of God, and we rejoice uh, in the truth of that. Well, they got there, though, and the Bible says in verse 4 that they said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And there's a lot of debate here into verse number four. Does that mean then that Paul was in some way going to now be disobedient to what it was that God was commanding him? Well, let me point out to you that even though they said it through the Spirit, Paul did not necessarily know that it was through the Spirit, for one. Okay? They are saying it. They're feeling led to say, hey, Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem, but he doesn't necessarily know, or nor does he perceive, that it is God who's telling him not to go to Jerusalem. By the way, I do not feel that he is wrong in going to Jerusalem. Why is that? Well, drop down, for example, just very quickly, down to verse number uh, 13. And the Bible says, as he's speaking to some other ones, Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? Notice, for I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, that doesn't suggest a disobedient Christian. The, the, uh, disobedient Christians are not going to have that same mindset. Uh, if you'll go ahead to chapter number 23, and I believe it's verse number 10, I'm sorry, verse number 11 of Acts 23, the night following, uh, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou also bear witness at Rome. I believe when we look at everything that is going on, as well as later on when we see Agabus, uh, who comes to him and prophesies of trouble that's going to be there, I believe that it was still very much God's will that Paul go to Jerusalem. What does he have? He's taken the collection for the saints from Macedonia and Achaia and all that, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. I believe he was perfectly in accordance with God's will. I do not believe he was disobedient. I don't believe that he was punished uh, as a result of being disobedient. I will be honest with you and say there are others who disagree with me on that. You study it and you come to your own conclusions on it. Don't just say, well, I said this, therefore that's a fact. That's my opinion that he's not wrong. 
But they begin to say, well, don't go to Jerusalem. We'll talk a little bit more about perhaps why some of that a little bit later on. Well, when we had accomplished those days, now a week later, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. It, it had to have been quite the sight to see. Here they are, they all get together, and they all begin to uh, work. It's now time for Paul and his companions to leave, and so they all begin walking with him out of the city. Uh, the men are obviously there, the wives are there, the children are there, and they get there. And once they get out of the city, the Bible says they knelt down on the shore right before Paul is about to take off, and they prayed. Do you think others observed that? You think it would have made a difference? think it would have made an impact in some people's minds? Have you observed someone praying at a restaurant before? I don't mean truly praying. Does it not encourage you when you see that? You see someone who is willing to actually bow their heads and not act as though they have allergies <laughs> uh, and thank the Lord for their food. Uh, thank, them, thank Him for saving them and, and what He's done. Has it ever occurred to you that people watch you? And there are times, I believe, when unsaved are looking for exactly what you do before you eat. Okay? It's a little way that you're able to be a witness. They're going to pay attention to it, and they're going to point out any inconsistencies there as well, so be sure that you are consistent in it. Well, when we had taken our leave one of another, in other words, we all said our goodbyes, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came down, it's about 25 miles, to Ptolemus, or Ptolemaeus, rather, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. Now, all he's doing is he's going right down the coast. So he goes from Tyre down to the next city, Ptolemaeus. It's about uh, 25 miles or so south. The next day, verse 8, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. Now we're getting down closer to Jerusalem. This is going to be about another 30 miles south. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Philip was the individual, you may recall, all the way back in Acts chapter 6. Do you remember when the uh, Grecian widows were being neglected? And so there are the, uh, and they come up with a complaint and say, you know what, uh, we're not fulfilling this role as we need to, and uh, we need to, to make an adjustment here. And the apostles recognize that if they would tend to the task of administering the tables and serving the tables, that it would actually detract them from doing what it was that they were called to do. And so they told them, well, it's not reason, it's not appropriate that we would leave the Word of God and to serve tables. Now let me point out to you, it's not that they were unwilling to do so. They recognized instead that there was a greater priority to which they needed to, to devote themselves and they were unwilling to be sidetracked by that. And so their solution was, well, you appoint, you choose seven men, and then they provided some qualifications and appoint them over this business. That then would enable the apostles to give themselves entirely to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. One of the seven that they chose, even as Acts 21 uh, verse number 8 reminds us, was this man by the name of Philip. The next time we see him is in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Philip happens to be in Samaria. And while he is in Samaria, all sorts of things uh, are being done. People are being saved. Lives are being changed. People are being healed. And God says, all right, Philip, it's time for you to go. Sometimes those are the most difficult times to go. When everything seems to be going well. Uh, those are the times when we want to stay. There are other times when it's very easy uh, to want to go. But Philip says, or God says, I, I need you to go. And I need you to go because there's a man who's riding a chariot. He's got some questions. <laughs> Off, miraculously, Philip ends up being put right there. Here's this man who is from Ethiopia, and he's reading, and he's troubled by what it is that he's reading. And so he's out of Isaiah 53, and he asks Philip, Philip, can you explain this to me? And, of course, Philip does so, and, and that man was saved. 
And later on, immediately, even as the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, he was baptized. Well, Philip lived in Caesarea. And so the area kind of that he was ministering in uh, was all up in this area, and he is living here in Caesarea. And they entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, and that term is given to distinguish him from the Philip who is the apostle. He was one of the seven, and we abode or we stayed with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So they were obviously unmarried, and they were likewise pure. But there is some interesting statements that they prophesied. Well, what's that mean? And there are some who look at this and say, well, that means that uh, a lady is given the authority to preach. And they will cite uh, this particular passage, and they will use this uh, as an example of uh, where Paul is saying that something like this uh, is going to be okay. Now, let me point out to you, Paul is not saying in any stretch of the imagination uh, that, that that is okay. Now, is it okay for ladies to teach? Well, yes, when it's just ladies, okay? But the Word of God makes it very clear that there are times then when a lady is not to be speaking. And there are some who will look at this and uh, they will immediately say, well, uh, here is uh, the uh, proof that says uh, maybe a, a lady should be a pastor. Uh, well, there are other passages in Scripture that are uh, going to indicate much differently. In fact, Paul had to address this very issue uh, with the church at Corinth. And uh, there were a lot of things that were going on. There was a tremendous amount of confusion going on in the church at Corinth. And uh, Paul reminded them God's not the author of confusion. Uh, and he's never has been. He never will be. God is a God of order. But this was the instruction that Paul stated. If you want to turn to it, you can. 1 Corinthians 14, and it's down to verse number 34. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church." Now, let me point out to you that uh, as I was entering in earlier on today and as we shook hands, some of you ladies talked. Okay? Um, is God saying that women are not allowed to talk in church? No. Okay? Uh, God does not give us commands that are incapable of being fulfilled. I'm teasing. Uh, but anyway... Uh, <laughs> Some of you may pick that up. Others of you are going to slap me later on. And that's okay. I deserve it. I'm just teasing, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> they're, going to, they're going to speak. They're going to speak their mind. What is it that's being stated here? The context is this. Women should not be teaching when the men are present. Okay? Is this some um, slavish mindset that the women are to just be under the thumb of their husband? No, that's not what's being stated at all, okay? But it's designed to keep things where they need to be. Paul also addressed this in the book of 1 Timothy. You can turn over uh, there as well. 1 Timothy, I believe it's chapter number 2. It is. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, Paul addresses with women. Um, he says, that uh, verse 9, we'll pick it up there, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. In other words, ladies, don't do things that are designed to just simply attract attention to yourself. Is it okay that a lady looks nice? Yes. Is it okay if they wear makeup? Yes. Is it okay if they wear jewelry? Yes, it is. But what we're saying is we don't want to Draw the attention is not to be to you, the attention is to ultimately be to the Lord. And anything, male or female, that detracts from that is wrong. Okay, but it goes on, it says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. All that is being stated is God has a chain of command in essence. God has a certain way that things are to be done. It's okay for ladies to have Bible studies with ladies. That's fine. But a lady should not be in a forum where she is speaking to, to the men. Now, 
That's in a church setting. That's not as teachers, okay, in a school classroom or in a convention or something like that. I've sat in sessions where I've heard a lady teaching that session. There's no problem with that. We're dealing with church. And so don't take this uh, to an extreme that God uh, never intended. All right. So now, nonetheless, now back to Acts 21. Philip has four daughters, all of whom are virgins and all of whom are prophesying. They're all uh, engaged in ministering. What a testimony and what a compliment that is given to Philip, who now has all four of his daughters serving the Lord. Could there be, as a parent, any greater joy? The answer is no. It goes on and it says, As we tarried there many days, an unspecified number, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. Judea is higher in elevation. That's why the statement is down. When we think of down, you might think of going from uh, Virginia down to Florida. Okay, well, that's, we're not speaking north-south. We're speaking elevation. So here comes Agabus. Now, Agabus, we've already seen Agabus. Agabus was all the way back in Acts chapter number 11 and verse 28. He stood up and said, there's going to be a great dearth throughout all the world came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. That's Acts eleven twenty eight. 28. Here comes Agabus, and when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle, Paul's leather belt, and bound his own hands and feet. Now, I, I do have to say I've always been puzzled by this image and exactly how he managed to do that. Bind your feet first, and now, I, I don't know, but he did so, and uh, eventually, he said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle. Who owns it? Be a great day to let someone borrow it, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, it's his. <laughs> um, and it shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, is there anything in verse 11 that would suggest don't go to Jerusalem? No. No. What Paul is being told by Agabus is, Paul, there are going to be some difficult times ahead. And he does so in a, a very graphic way. And when we heard these things, both we and they of the place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. As soon as they heard his message, they all began begging him, Paul, 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 don't go, don't go, don't go. Then Paul answered in verse 13, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. What is it that you guys are, are so bothered by? Why is it that you're trying to dissuade me? He says, I am resolved to the point where I'm willing not only to be bound, but even if necessary, to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. Now let me point out a couple of things by way of application through this. Number one, difficulties do not equate to punishment. Difficulties do not equate to punishment. God allows trials in our life. Does that mean that the person that he has allowed those trials in is guilty of some heinous sin? Not necessarily. Now, it is certainly possible that that is uh, a, a possibility, but it certainly does not mean that this individual, because this has happened, is guilty of some horrific sin. In fact, it, it was stated that, you know what, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. There are going to be difficult times. Paul told Timothy, they that uh, will those who will live godly in Christ Jesus, let me phrase it this way, those, those who determine to live godly in Christ Jesus, they will suffer persecution. He told Timothy that in the last times, perilous times are going to come. 
Things are going to be difficult, so we cannot sit here and say that difficulties automatically equate to punishment. We also need to recognize the path of least resistance may not be God's will. The path of least resistance may not be God's will. Water's kind of a unique thing. Water makes its own path. Okay? Uh, it's rather unique. If you've ever taken a garden hose and for whatever reason wanted to get more on your water bill, just held it to the ground, what you'll find is that it will begin eroding things. And that water, it doesn't just go straight. It just naturally works its way around stuff. It always takes the path of least resistance. The reality is that oftentimes we want the path of least resistance. We want the blessing of the Christian life, but we really want it to come very easily. We want these, the rewards, but we really don't want the challenges. Lord, I want you to grow my faith, but I don't want you to do so through hardship. I want you to grow my faith through blessing. So Lord, give me a million dollars. Give me the blessing. You know what? I don't know, maybe you're guilty of this, maybe you're not. Many, many of us are guilty of constantly praying, Lord bless, Lord bless, Lord bless, Lord bless, Lord bless. Most of us in our minds when we're praying that, we're praying, Lord, you know, bless this job, bless this effort, bless this work. And what we're doing is we're trying to make it maybe as easy as can be. Uh, let's say it this way. If you were to pray, maybe illustrate it a little differently. If you were to, to get up in the morning and you pray, Lord, bless my day. What do you mean by that? Honestly. Lord, I want, I want an easy day. Okay? I want it to be a prosperous day. I want to be able to get done whatever I need to be able to get done. And just, I don't want problems. I don't want conflict. I don't want opposition. I want everything to run like it's supposed to run. When the day is done at 5 o'clock, then everything's done that needs, that's what I want. You know, that may not be what God wants. God's will is not always the path of least resistance. It's those trials that actually make something of us. Amen. Let's turn over to James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. If you've read the handouts recently, you've probably noticed something rather consecutive. If you haven't, then that's okay. James chapter number one. I want you to notice verse number uh, two. These are the tribes who've been scattered. And he says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. How does God produce endurance? The trials. That's how God gives you the fortitude. That's how God gives you the what is necessary. Athletes who train at a competitive level understand that there will be pain. There will be those points when you have to push your way through. It is not always going to be easy. There will be times when you simply do not feel like training, but yet the athlete who truly wishes to be competitive understands his entire focus has to be geared towards that, and he will work through that opposition. So then, now back to Acts 21. Why is it that these individuals are so determined Paul don't go to Jerusalem? Because they don't want to see anything happen to him. 
And that leads me to this. Sometimes those whom we love have to face the difficulties. And I think that is one of the greatest challenges. Sometimes those whom we love have to face the difficulties. Parents in here, what do you want for your children? Things to be better. Things to be easier. That's not always what God wants. Most parents who have seen their children go through a hard time, a difficult time, maybe a painful experience, maybe some sort of an illness, most parents would gladly say, I'll take that. Give that to me. Don't make them go through that. But sometimes that's not God's will. Why does God allow young children to have leukemia? I don't understand that. He does. Why does God allow young children sometimes to be in an accident? Maybe fatal, maybe it's not fatal. Again, I don't understand that. But He does. Why does God allow a mother to carry a baby all the way up to the time it's due to deliver a stillborn child? I don't understand these things. Obviously, there the mother is going through these things. But my point of it is to say this. Oftentimes, we want to shelter those whom we love. And we want to put a bubble up over top of them. <laughs> we want to protect them. And to a degree, that is a job of a parent. You, you don't just say, oh, yeah, hey, go do whatever you want to do. Uh, here are the keys. Uh, you know, just have fun. Whatever it is, just have fun. No, we, we, we try to provide a, that bubble. But the reality is sometimes God needs to work on them. And sometimes God needs to work on you. And it's the process of you letting go to let God accomplish his work. Amen. As parents age, I am learning that that's not always an enjoyable process to watch. And uh, you, you begin to see things that, that they used to be able to do and they can't do any longer. And, and you know, who, whose hands are they in? God's. I anticipate when I go down to Florida here in another week or so that my dad's hip surgery is going to go well and everything's going to be fine. What if it doesn't? You see? Now, my prayer is that it does. My prayer is that this resolves everything for him. But, you know, sometimes that's not God's will. And these individuals, to me, as I read through this, don't want to lose Paul. And so they beg him not to go. Paul says, you know what, I've got to go because that's what's right. I'm in the Lord's hands. Notice it goes on, and we'll cover it quickly. When he would not be persuaded, verse 14, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. All right, Paul, fine. God's will be accomplished. Let me ask you this. Do you really want God's will accomplished? I want God's will accomplished when God's going to give me a million dollars. Lord, your will be accomplished. Okay? Hasten the blessing. <laughs> but when it's adversity, it's much more challenging and a surrender, a willingness to surrender to that which God is doing. After those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. Now from uh, Caesarea to Jerusalem, it's going to be a journey of about 50 miles, but now we're going to be going over land. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, so now there's going to be a, a larger following that's going to go. And one, they brought with them one, Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. Nason uh, was an individual who was from the island of Cyprus, and uh, he was one that there would end up lodging. And eventually, verse 17, when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. This was a very lengthy journey for Paul to make. In fact, the journey from uh, over to Tyre, uh, was a journey that, depending on the wind conditions, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a journey of around 400 miles. 
and could last anywhere from two to four weeks. Okay, this didn't all happen uh, just instantly. But did Paul end up in Jerusalem where he was supposed to be? And he did. He's going to encounter opposition. He's going to encounter some challenges that are there. But those are things that are within God's will. I don't know what you're faced with today. Often we want to pray for a smooth road. Someone described it well. Maybe we should pray for better shock absorbers. We want everything to go well. We want everything to go well for those whom we love. We like the path of least resistance because it doesn't challenge us. But what is your level of Christianity in the midst of opposition? Paul's going to face some incredible challenges ahead. You have no idea what you're going to face today, let alone in years to come. Is your faith rooted and grounded where it needs to be so that you can go through those times and honor God in that process? What if it's not the answer that you are praying for? Medically, we always pray that, you know, the person is healed, the tests come back. Um, if you say negative, that's really what you want. But tests come back negative, meaning positive, okay? We want it favorable. What if it's not? Where's your faith at that point? God may not take all path of least resistance. He may challenge you to truly let go of those whom you love and surrender them likewise to God's control. Because that was exactly what these disciples had to do here. All right, Paul, you're in God's hands. That's a difficult place to get may be a child who wanders away from the Lord. God, they're in your hands. Do you pray do what's necessary to bring them back? You see? That's not an easy prayer to pray. Because you know that may very well mean something difficult for them. You know what's best Lord, if there's another way, could we do that? <laughs> could we do one that's a little bit easier? You see the challenges there? I think if you ponder this passage, I think what you'll find is we're faced with a lot of uncertainty. And I think what you'll find is there are lots of opportunities for us to surrender that uncertainty as well as those whom we love. And say, God, they're, they're in your hands. As challenging as that can be. As musicians come forward. Uh...